I'm Edward Warfield. I'm the publisher of City Biz. I'm honored today to interview Michael Mufson, the CEO of Mufson Hal Hunter. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about your career? Sure. Um, I have, it's a bit of, a, of an oxymoron, a uh, Philadelphia investment banker. There is a lively investment banking community in Philadelphia, and I've been doing investment banking in Philadelphia for over 30 years. I started with a firm in Philadelphia that was the uh, investment bank called Butcher and Singer, which most people today know the restaurant Butcher and Singer, but that was our building, and the name came from the firm. And I was a young uh, head of investment banking there and spent the uh, better part of 15 years uh, growing their investment banking group. We eventually merged uh, with Wheat First Securities, and now the firm is part of um, Wachovia, or Wells Fargo, excuse me. There's been so many iterations. Wells Fargo. I then uh, started up uh, an investment bank. I've always been entrepreneurial in investment banking. And... Uh, started up a firm called Foley Muffs and Howe, and it was acquired by Johnny Montgomery Scott. And Johnny had a very uh, nascent investment banking effort at the time, maybe two or three people. And uh, when I left Johnny a, a good eight years later, we were probably 35, 40 people, so we grew that rapidly. And um, then I uh, uh, started up the equity capital markets for uh, a very well-known high-growth bank called Commerce Bank Corp. And, um, and then um, after that, uh, the bank changed strategic direction and uh, we started up this firm. All of us at the firm, the principals, have worked together at one of those organizations. The average partner and I have been working for over 20 years together. So we kind of all followed each other around uh, the Philadelphia firms. So it's a tight, tight-knit culture at Mux and Eleanor. Can you provide us an overview of the firm? How many investment bankers, the sector focus? Uh, sure. Some major transactions prior to this year? Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, we are uh, 14 people. Uh, we primarily, at, at the firm, uh, primarily do uh, sell side M&A for what we call first to market, privately held and family businesses. So we're the first time uh, these large family businesses uh, have interacted with an investment bank and raised institutional money. Um, we um, try to focus our efforts in uh, four uh, industry verticals, uh, business services, which would be professional service companies, um, facility management companies, staffing companies, things that are uh, time and material contracts for um, uh, for business to business services. Uh, the next area that we're we're very focused on is consumer uh, and consumer products and services. And we've had a couple of uh, sub industries in there that we focus on, which I can talk about in a moment. Uh, we have a, a very good tech services effort, which is mostly IT services. And then finally, we have an industrial. Uh, bent uh, a vertical um, that Mike Howell runs, which he likes to refer to as dirty fingernail companies. Um, so that's kind of where we play, mostly sell side M&A. And um, most, about three quarters of that is being sold as recaps to private equity firms around the country. Can you provide some highlights of the major deals that you've been involved in this year? Sure. I mean, one is in a very large uh, roll-up in uh, the door space. Uh, Unified um, was, was a very large uh, recap that was done um, with uh, Dunes Point Capital out of Rye, New York. Uh, Unified Door and Hardware was itself a combination of about five or six um, door distributors, and uh, we were a very successful transaction. Um, and um, our tech services group um, did a number of uh, acquisitions uh, uh, for clients this year. Uh, a predictive analytics company, Trove, uh, was bought by a private equity firm. And uh, Unified Health, another lo local company, uh, was um, Harris Healthcare. Uh, we also did a, a co-packing. Uh, one of the sub-verticals in our consumer is food. And uh, we've done a number of transactions in the food space. One uh, was a, in Vineland, New Jersey, a very large co-packer 
for a New York Stock Exchange company. We sold that bakery, uh, commercial bakery, uh, to um, uh, Lancaster Colony. Uh, we're now in the process of doing a number of food companies, one quite large in southern New Jersey that we'll hopefully announce in the next few weeks. So most of what we do tends to be, you know, five to 25 million of EBITDA. Sometimes we'll dip below that uh, if it's an industry space we like, we know, and it can be sold as a tuck-in. And, you know, we do a number of deals at 25 plus EBITDA. So it's a pretty wide range for a sell-side M&A firm. But most of what we do is five to 15 million of EBITDA. And uh, we like to call that the lower end of the middle market. So the you know the public markets are frothy. There's lots of IPOs and SPACs. Uh, so what is the state of the deal flow in the middle market? The data of the M and A markets are quite strong, and um, it is like the stock market. It's very much divorced from the economy. Uh, we're not in a great economy, but yet the stock markets are buoyant, and the M and A markets are rip roaring. And the reason for that is. Uh, um, the combination of virtually low cost debt, record number of uh, private equity dry powder, uh, and balance sheets of public companies that are seeing historical highs in their valuations. So you put that all in a pot and you've got the perfect environment for people to be buying other businesses. So uh, the businesses that are attractive right now are technology businesses and uh, in particular, tech service companies that are helping uh, uh, brick and mortar businesses, classical business, digitize to really keep pace with what's going on in our direct to consumer and e commerce uh, economy. One area we focus on is in food production, and um, we're seeing um, in five to seven months a um, change that would have taken five to seven years because of COVID, we're not going to supermarkets. I, we used to go three times plus a week on average. It's below one right now. We're using Instacarts and delivery services, and it requires the infrastructure to be able to deliver rapidly, have what the c consumer is looking to buy on hand, and have that all come together where it's delivered on time and a happy customer. Uh, so those companies are doing quite well. So you're seeing a lot of uh, technology service businesses that are being bought up by private equity firms that historically might not have looked at these companies. Uh, also in the, in the food space, there's a lot of activity among um, uh, private equity and the strategics to grow because um, in retail, food retail, uh, we're not going out to eat. So that's a sector that has lost a lot of interest at the moment. The whole food service is down, but retail is up you know, two or three times volumes. And most experts believe that that will be a trend that isn't COVID related, it will continue on. And companies are building uh, to, to service that infrastructure as we speak. So what has been the impact of, of COVID-19 on your management of the company? And it sounds like in the sectors that you're covering, the sectors seem like they are, are, are doing well. Yeah, most are, but uh, there are sectors that, uh, you know, that aren't doing well. And in a consumer, we, we like companies, we call them architectural finishes. Um, so doors, doorknobs, uh, tile, stone. Um, wall art. Um, they're doing well in rehabbing right now, but prior to COVID, the commercial markets were rip roaring because we were building um, office buildings. Office buildings are being renovated, uh, and that has slowed up, but the rehab side of architectural finishes have increased. So a lot of the companies are seeing slightly down to flat. Um, so those businesses are doing okay. Uh, anything in hospitality, leisure, um, restaurants uh, are hurting, and it's, it's hard to get uh, growth investors, and we mostly deal with strong growing companies. There are a whole subclass of um, investors that look for deals that we say have some hair on it, but that's not uh, the focus of our firm. 
And so your personal focus has been on the consumer space. Can you define that? And again, tell us about some of the deals that you uh, have been involved in in the consumer space. Sure. You know, I, I mentioned Unified Door and Hardware. We did um, uh, Omni Baking uh, was, was a baking company. We did a, uh, a rug, uh, 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 very high-end consumer rug company, uh, Elizabeth Aikens. Um, and... Um, um, I'm running through my, uh, we've been involved in um, uh, distributors that provide uh, restaurants with um, uh, non-perishable items like forks, spoons, lobster bibs, uh, has, has been a, um, uh, a client of ours. You know, one business we did, which is uh, uh, very interesting, was a company called Cherry Hill Photo. And Cherry Hill was started in, in the Cherry Hill Mall probably 40, 50 years ago as a photographer started taking pictures of Santa Claus. Well, roll ahead uh, 35, 40 years, that business is uh, uh, doing 40 million plus in revenues and 15% EBITDA margins. And uh, this is pre-COVID. And um, only in America can uh, you build a business supplying Santa Clauses to shopping malls around the country. Uh, and that was bought by a family office in, in Chicago. Uh, so it really kind of runs the gamut. You know, we, uh, another company we did was York Wall Coverings, which is one of the largest and certainly the oldest wall covering, which is uh, wallpaper, but uh, there are many different substrates on wallpaper. So the industry parlance is wall coverings. Um, so, you know, it runs the gamut of uh, food and, um, and consumer product companies. Um, but our, our focus of late has been in architectural and, and in food. So let's sort of summarize, you know, which sectors are thriving and which ones do you see as lackluster and not really coming back? Uh, you know, I think the uh, hospitality space is going to have a, I mean, we're just fortunate the industry groups we covered, uh, but if I had a hospitality and leisure group right now, it would be a hard situation because um, we're not, staying we're not business travel is down and uh, we don't we can talk about the airlines we can talk about you know in the hospitality space all the, the smaller companies that provide hotels with services people that do wallpaper commercial wallpaper uh and wall covering work in hotels are not doing that right now they don't have the budget to renovate people who supply the furniture people who are doing a lot of the cleaning uh people who do um uh, IT services for uh, that space that they're not active right now. So um, any business that is really uh, in the restaurant space, uh, excuse me, hospitality and restaurants is really struggling right now. And uh, when that will come back is anyone's guess. I think, you know, we're, we're trying to force it on the consumer, but it's, you know, depending on the area of the country and the demographic you're working with, it's a hard sell to get people to hop on airplanes to stay in hotels, to uh, rent cars, to go out for dinner, to restaurants. Um, and, you know, that's going to be, you know, a good 12 to 24 months before that kind of stabilizes, I believe. So do you have any predictions for 2021? You know, I, I, uh, I, I would have thought uh, the, the COVID uh, period, the M&A markets would come to a screeching halt. We saw in March the... The credit markets are what drives everything for the m a uh, world if uh, if credit becomes um, uh, less plentiful or uh, lenders pull back on leverage ratios, which we saw a little bit of that uh, in March and April and then by you know May June it kind of worked its way through um, that would not be a good sign. I think the period we're in now for family held businesses, closely held businesses that never thought something like COVID-19 could affect their businesses. Um, a lot of companies and a lot of families we spoke to were doing so well up until uh, March um, that they didn't have an alternative for the proceeds they were going to be collecting from the sale. So they felt it was better to keep their capital in their business. Now we're seeing people wanting to diversify, wanting to have some of that nest egg in, in, a, in a liquid form. So we're starting to see some businesses that might have waited to come to market uh, 
now a little more anxious to, to get something done. Um, coincidentally, right now we're working with a number of companies trying to get done by year end because uh, of um, the Biden uh, tax plan is talking about capital gains increases. And I, I won't be get political here. Uh, I'll just be factual. So a lot of people are excited about the Biden uh, period, but you know they're trying to get something done before year end, uh, so uh, they can pay a lower uh, a cap gain rate, which is forcing a number of companies right now to make us jump through hoops to get things done. So that there are a number of companies that we're working on to get done by year end. Michael, I want to say thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights on the mid middle market investment banking world that you live in. Well, I appreciate it uh, anytime and uh, I enjoyed it.